you have once again stepped into the world of survival horror. Good luck. Shortly after the release of the groundbreaking Resident Evil, Capcom quickly decided to make a sequel. This project would be directed by Capcom newcomer Hideki Kamiya. The original director of Resident Evil, Shinji Mikami, would return to this project in the role of producer. Now, Resident Evil 2's development was a pretty rocky road. Mikami and Kamiya would often have many disagreements about the direction this game was going in. The early build of the game, dubbed Resident Evil 1.5, wasn't doing anything for Mikami. He thought that the game's art assets and characters were fine on their own, but thought the gameplay and locations were very boring and dull. This led Mikami to take a more distant position in his producer role. He didn't want to influence the dev team directly, and only requested monthly updates on the game's development. Apparently, after reaching 60-80% to 80 completion, the current build of the game was scrapped due to a lack of quality. Instead of releasing an unsatisfactory product, the dev team decided to push the game's release date back and recreate the whole thing from scratch. This would include most of the story events, character motivations, and the game's police station setting. Japanese screenwriter Noburo Sugimura was even brought in to rewrite the game's story. Sugimura was very excited to work on this project because he was a fan of the first game and was able to come up with ideas and fix the problems the initial build of the game had with its narrative. With screenwriter Sugimura on board, director Kamiya decided to take a more Hollywood approach to the game's story and presentation. This would be a massive improvement over RE1's campy style. Kamiya believed that with this Hollywood film style, RE2 would be able to reach a broader audience, but it wasn't just the story that would be improved. Every aspect of this title improves upon the game mechanics, controls, and graphics introduced in the original Resident Evil, culminating in an unforgettable video game, and some would say, the perfect sequel. So without further ado, let's take a deep dive into Resident Evil 2. Resident Evil 2's gameplay is relatively unchanged from its predecessor. The game still uses tank controls, fixed camera angles, and pre-rendered environments, but all of these things have been upgraded. Along with these bigger upgrades to the gameplay formula, a lot of smaller changes were made that when added up together make a very big improvement over the original Resident Evil. Whether it be little things like walking upstairs faster, in-game text moving at the speed of light, being able to swap grenade types for the grenade launcher, or zombies violently jerking back when you shoot them, it all makes for a more satisfying and tighter gameplay experience. Speaking of tighter gameplay, the controls and animations feel much more polished this time around. The way the characters move feels more grounded, like every action you make has some weight to it. The first game's animations were kinda floaty looking, it was very noticeable, but in Resident Evil 2 everything just looks and flows better. A new feature introduced in Resident Evil 2 is the addition of limping. Now when you take damage, your character will start limping around, letting you know that they're not doing so well. As you take more and more damage, your limping will get worse. It actually affects your movement speed too, so walking in a straight line and turning is much slower as you approach death. This can make some encounters really scary, because now you can't just run away if you're about to die. You'll be slowly waddling away from monsters, trying your best to get as far from them as you can. For such a simple mechanic, it really makes you feel like you're trying to survive in this zombie apocalypse. I actually forgot to mention that the first game used pre-rendered backgrounds for its game world. If you don't know what I'm talking about, basically all of the environments in early Resident Evil games are made up of pre-rendered images. So all of the backgrounds are just really nice pictures. In the first game they were good, but they also lacked a lot of detail. All of the backgrounds in Resident Evil 2 have a lot of density to them and they feel like real places. Besides the whole no bathrooms in the police station thing, but you know, design oversight I guess. In the first game, a lot of the mansion's rooms were very well lit and kind of empty, which I guess is also kind of creepy in its own way. Like, oh there's just a shelf and a desk in here. Hmm. The environments you'll be visiting in Resident Evil 2 look awesome, and do a very good job of making the game's world feel unique and stand out from the rest of the series. I'm actually really glad that Kamiya's team decided to redesign the police station, because honestly, the original build of the game, like Mikami said, looked pretty dull and boring. The original police station just looked like a real-life precinct. The one we got in the final game has actual history to it. Like before the RPD moved in, the building was used as an art museum. That's why its layout is kind of strange, but also interesting. It's way better than just a normal looking grey building. 
Just like the first game, you get the choice of picking one of two characters to play as, Leon Kennedy or Claire Redfield. This time you don't just pick one or the other from a character select screen, instead each character has their own disc. The reason for this is because both characters have an A and B scenario that I'll tell you more about later on. Both characters have their own weapons that they acquire on their separate journeys. Claire gets a grenade launcher and bow gun. Leon gets a shotgun and magnum. Claire's grenade launcher is probably my favorite Resident Evil weapon. Just like the first game, it has three different ammo types. Explosive, flame, and acid. Unlike the first game, each grenade type has been rebalanced. The explosive rounds are still very powerful, but now they have a shorter range and actually arc down. So you have to get closer to your enemies when firing, making these grenades feel more like a crowd control option rather than just a blow up everything option. The flame and acid rounds shoot straighter, but are best saved for specific enemies since they're hard to come by. The acid rounds are most effective against the liquor and G-virus infected enemies, and the flame rounds take down the IV monsters with ease. This one weapon has so much more depth and experimentation than it did in the first game. It's pretty cool. While Leon doesn't get as many options with different firearm types, all of the weapons he does get are upgradable with optional weapon parts that you can find throughout his game. Upgrading the pistol, for example, turns it from a semi-automatic to a powerful three-shot burst handgun, and the upgraded shotgun is very satisfying to use. The devs did a really good job at rebalancing and implementing brand new options for these standard weapons. I'll say it again, it's really cool. Both Leon and Claire have a permanent starting item in their inventories. Leon has a lighter, which you can use to solve certain puzzles early, and Claire has a lockpick, just like Jill from the first game, making Claire the second master of unlocking. In my Resident Evil 1 video, I talk about how Chris's game felt more difficult than Jill's, with him having less inventory slots, having to pick up the small key items, and not getting the grenade launcher. I think the devs kept this in mind when making Resident Evil 2. Both characters' games definitely feel more balanced this time around. The small key item actually does make its return for Leon's game, but this time, they don't unlock important doors. They only open optional locks, and they stack, so having multiple small keys won't take up more than one item slot in Leon's inventory. There are also no puzzles that you can bypass as one particular character, either. The puzzles that appear in both characters' games play out in the same way, but each character will find a different key item. There are also unique puzzles and story events in each of our characters' scenarios, which brings us to Resident Evil 2's story. Now, like I said earlier, director Kamiya wanted to go for a more Hollywood approach to this game, which means Resident Evil 2's story is really big. So buckle up, because I'm about to cover the entire thing. Resident Evil 2's story takes place two months after the events of the first game. We begin our story with Claire Redfield. Claire is making her way into Raccoon City. She's in town searching for her older brother Chris Redfield, one of the protagonists from the first game. She stops in at a diner, and everything seems normal enough, but there aren't any people around. It's very quiet. Searching the diner, Claire stumbles upon a man slumped over and eating a dead body. The man gets up, moaning and slowly walking towards Claire, and it's at this point that Claire realizes that she's surrounded by zombies. With no other options, Claire makes for the emergency exit, only to be surprised by a young police officer aiming his gun at her. We can't stay out here. Head to the police station. It'll be a lot safer. Together, the two run off and find an abandoned police car. From there, they head to the Raccoon City Police Station. During their drive, they become acquainted with one another and learn why the other is in town. The young man, Leon Kennedy, also just arrived in town for his first day on the police force. Perfect timing. As the two make their way to the police station, they're caught off guard by a zombie hiding in the back seat, forcing the car to crash and throwing the zombie through the windshield. A pretty intense moment, but it's not over yet because right behind them is a big rig coming straight towards them, driven by a zombified man. The two make their escape from the car, but are separated by the crashing rig. Claire and Leon both head to the police station, but all of this is just the beginning of their worst nightmare. Like the first game, the gameplay and story of RE2 go hand in hand. After separating from Leon, the first segment of the game is a mad dash to the police station via the streets of Raccoon City. The entire city portion of the game is linear, and makes for a very exciting and cinematic experience. You'll be dodging zombies and running through back alleys, narrowly avoiding the undead as you try to get to your destination. Once you arrive at the RPD, you'll be doing a lot of the same things that you did in the first game's mansion, like puzzle solving, finding themed key items to unlock 
unlock specific doors, and getting used to the layout of the precinct. By the way, almost as soon as you step into this place, the game throws its horrifying new liquor enemy at you. The liquor is such an iconic monster. It pretty much has the strength of the first game's hunter enemy and very similar attacks, but the thing that makes liquors unique is that they don't have eyes. So if you play your cards right, you can actually sneak around to them. In your first encounter with this creature, there's actually broken glass on the floor, and if you step on it, it'll alert the monster. This is really cool, because the game throws this powerful enemy at you right in the beginning, but it also gives you the option to avoid them if you play carefully enough. Getting past that liquor gets you into the star's office, where you find Chris's diary, which explains how he's already left town to track down Umbrella. After solving a quick puzzle, you get your hands on a new key and also run into a little girl being attacked by a zombie. Following the girl, you meet up with Leon again. He lets you know that the girl ran away by crawling through a small hole in a boarded up door. There's no way to get to her. Since you just missed her, you and Leon split up again. It's up to you to find this girl while Leon tries to find a way out of the precinct. Exploring the police station's second floor, you solve more puzzles, granting you stone tablet-like items. You also find in one of the hallways a flaming helicopter that's crashed into the side of the building. You make your way outside to the back of the police station where you find the other side of the crashed chopper. Just above it is a water tower that you use to put out the crashed vehicle's flames. Making your way back inside, you notice that it's impossible to get past the helicopter. But after some more exploration, you eventually find plastic explosives and use them to clear the wreckage blocking the hall. Exploring this side of the police station reveals a much darker side to our story. You find the police chief's office and... Oh, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> I thought you were another one of those zombies. Are you Chief Irons? Yes, that's me. And just who are you? No, don't bother telling me. It makes no difference. You'll end up just like all the others. That's the mayor's daughter. I was told to look after her, but I failed miserably. Just look at her. She was a true beauty. Her skin nothing short of perfection. But it will soon putrefy and she will turn into a zombie within the hour like all the others. There must be some way to stop it. In a manner of speaking, there is. Either by putting a bullet through her brain, or by decapitating her completely. And to think that taxidermy used to be my hobby. But no longer. Please, I'd really like to be alone now. Yeah, Chief Irons seems pretty creepy. Leaving the office, you enter a room decorated with all kinds of valuables, almost like a museum. The room is dark, and you can hear the footsteps of someone sneaking around nearby. Finding a light switch in the back of the room, you find out who is sneaking around. It's the little girl. She tries to run away, but Claire catches her hand in the nick of time, and the two have a nice, reassuring conversation. We learn that the girl's name is Sherry Birkin, and that her parents are both researchers at the nearby Umbrella Chemical Plant. Sherry's mother told her to wait for her at the police station, but obviously, that was a bad idea. After hearing a loud, monstrous roar in the hallway, Sherry tells us that a huge creature has been chasing after her. Then she runs off again. After leaving the museum room and heading back to the chief's office, we see that both the chief and the body of the mayor's daughter are gone. On the chief's desk, you find a key that leads you to the basement of the police station. And moving the painting behind the desk reveals three slots in the wall where you can place the stone tablet items you've been finding here. Heading to the basement and going deeper underground, you run into Sherry again. Claire tries her best to get Sherry to follow her, but Sherry runs off yet again and climbs through a small hole in a fenced-off wall. This time we actually get to play as Sherry, and side note, this is one of the weaker parts of the game for me. Actually, all of the parts that involve Sherry are kinda weak. If you've played the game, you know what I mean. As Sherry, we explore a small factory area, dodging zombie dogs and solving puzzles, nets us another key that we give back to Claire as we return to the fenced-off wall. Returning to Claire, Sherry realizes that there's no way for her to climb back up the wall, so she leaves to find her own way back. Switching to Claire, we head back up to the police station and finish the last remaining puzzles and acquire the final stone tablet item. 
Returning to the chief's office, we find Sherry waiting inside. Using the final tablet opens up a secret passage in one of the walls. There are papers scattered on the floor behind the wall, and reading them we find out that it's a letter sent to the chief from William Birkin, Sherry's father. In the letter, Birkin talks about the mansion incident two months prior and tells the police chief that he needs to keep an eye on the remaining STARS members and to make sure that none of their knowledge on the T-Virus gets out. Birkin also mentions that Umbrella is working on a more powerful virus known as the G-Virus. So not only is Irons a total creep, but he's working for Umbrella. After reading this letter, you take the chief's hidden elevator deeper down into the police station. As you walk down a dark hallway, you hear someone screaming. Continuing down the hall, you enter what seems like a medieval torture chamber. Irons is waiting inside for you. The police chief confesses that he's been working with Umbrella and Birkin on the new G-Virus, and tells Claire that no one is getting out of this city alive. As the chief rants on and on, he begins to feel an immense pain in his chest before splitting open with a small creature crawling out of his mangled body and down into the lower level of the torture chamber. Ew. Following the creature down the ladder, you find it mutating into a massive abomination. After a short battle with the monster, you return back to Iron's office to get Sherry. Together, Claire and Sherry head back down and find a secret ladder leading into the Raccoon City sewer system. It's here where we get to see our first look at Sherry's father. He's been severely infected with the G-Virus. Exploring the sewers, Claire and Sherry get separated once again. Sherry falls down into a garbage chute where we see the mutated William Birkin approach her, infecting her with the G-Virus. After a short trek through the sewer, Claire is held up at gunpoint by a mysterious woman that we learn is Sherry's mother, Annette Birkin. Annette accuses Claire of being a spy looking to steal the G-Virus, but Claire manages to talk some sense into Annette and informs her that Sherry is lost somewhere down here. Hearing this, Annette runs off to look for her daughter. Continuing your exploration, you cross a bridge that leads into a long system of hallways, and at the end, you can see Sherry face down in a pile of garbage. But as you get closer, you're attacked by a giant alligator that was hiding under the water. The monster begins chasing you, so you backtrack down the hallway and release the lock to an emergency propane tank. The alligator tries to swallow the tank, but it just gets stuck in its mouth. You shoot the tank, blasting the alligator's head into a million pieces. After this short scuffle, you regroup with Sherry and find some more key items that lead you out of the sewers and to a sky tram that brings you to a mysterious factory. Arriving at this factory, you find a train that's connected to a giant turntable elevator system. Riding this giant platform down into the factory, Sherry passes out from a stomach ache. It seems like her condition is getting worse. Just then, the train begins to shake, so you exit back to the platform only to discover that the infected William Birkin has you cornered. You have no choice but to fight. This battle is awesome. Birkin is much faster than a lot of the enemies you've been facing, and his attacks do a lot more damage, so you really have to manage your healing and reloads very wisely. The song that plays during this fight is really good too. It gets you pumped up, but also does a great job at making Birkin feel like a threat beyond measure. Eventually, Birkin goes down, and you head back inside the train as it makes it stop at the underground laboratory. After leaving Sherry to rest in a security room, Claire goes out to explore this mysterious location. The lab is pretty big, and you'll be doing your standard exploration and finding key items to progress further down. There's also a new enemy type down here, as well as more powerful liquors. The new ivy monster isn't too difficult. They only appear a few times, and they go down very easily with flame grenades. Once you restore the lab's power, you go down to the lowest level, and here you once again run into Annette Bergen. She points her gun at Claire, furious over the murder of her mutated husband. She explains how she's created another G-Virus sample that she won't let anyone steal away from her. A loud roar can be heard around the corner. It's William. Annette rushes over to greet her husband, but what she finds is not what she was expecting. William strikes Annette down, leaving her in a near-death state. With her last to dying breaths, Annette has a change of heart and gives Claire a file with instructions to make a G-Virus vaccine for her daughter Sherry. The final part of the game has you running all over the lab, creating the vaccine. As you make your way back up to the main floor, you spot Leon on a security camera. Claire calls him with her radio and tells him that he has to go get Sherry from the security room. Once you make the vaccine, it's time to get the hell out of here. You make your way to the laboratory's cargo room and activate the main elevator. It takes some time to get up to you, but while you wait, William Birkin is back to stop your escape. Birkin is relentless in this new powerful form. This battle is pretty tough. 
Once you deal enough damage, Birkin transforms again into a four-legged beast with incredible speed and mobility. He also has a powerful attack that can severely damage or kill you if you're low on HP. After a long battle with this nightmare monster, the elevator arrives and you take it down to the transport platform where the train is already taking off. Leon and Sherry have made it. You hop on the train and administer the vaccine to Sherry. It works, and together, our three survivors ride off into the sunset. It's finally over. But this isn't the end. To get the true ending, we have to go through Leon's side of the story. After separating from Claire, Leon heads to the police station. This time you enter through the back entrance. As soon as you arrive at the helipad, you see how the helicopter from Claire's story crashes into the police station. Entering the precinct, you'll be doing a lot of the same things you did in Claire's game, but now key items are located in different places, and instead of finding stone tablets, Leon gets chess piece shaped keys. Leon's story also sees him being pursued by a new threat, Mr. X. This hulking brute is incredibly powerful and best avoided. If you manage to defeat him when he shows up, he'll drop you some ammo, but in my opinion, it's not very worth it. Mr. X is kind of the villain in this scenario. He keeps showing up when you least expect it. Besides this new enemy, Leon also encounters different characters in his story. When you go underground, you take a different path than Claire did. As Leon, you'll be exploring the underground parking lot, and it's here where we meet a mysterious new character. I've been trying to find another way inside. Ada seems pretty shady, obviously not letting us in on the whole truth. Together, Leon and Ada push the wrecked police truck out of the way of the cell block door. In the cell block, we find a man locked behind bars. It's Ben, the guy that Ada mentioned from before. Ada asks Ben if he knows anything about what's been happening with the outbreak in the city. Ben is really stubborn, he's not giving up any info. He does tell us about a way to get out of the city through a manhole in the back of the police station. Ada runs off and we follow after her. Finding this manhole, we go down and end up in a small sewer-like area, where we find a room that has a door in it that uses the chess-themed keys we've been finding throughout Leon's journey. Leaving this room, we meet up with Ada. Leon gives her a boost up to a ventilation shaft, we see Sherry run away, dropping her necklace. Ada picks up the necklace and continues onward. This part of the game plays out very similarly to the first time we played as Sherry. Ada has to solve puzzles and make it past a few zombies to get the final precinct key. We return to Leon with the new key, but it's just like before with Sherry. There's no way for Ada to get back into the vent, so Ada just runs away. Returning to the police station, you finish up the remaining puzzles and gather all of the key items you need to progress. On this final visit, Mr. X is relentless. He shows up so many times and each time catches me off guard. I'm never ready for it. <laughs> Finding the final chess key brings you to a room with an old dust chute. You jump down and it brings you right back to the underground cell block from before. Landing on your feet, you can hear someone screaming from inside the cells. Getting back to the cells, you find Ben bleeding out. Before dying, Ben gives you a memo of his findings and tells you about the police chief working for Umbrella. Ada shows up and tells Leon that she's heading for the chemical plant. Returning back to the chess key door room, you find William Birkin inside, brandishing a giant steel pipe. After a quick boss fight, Birkin falls off of the platform that you're standing on, and you make your way to the chemical plant. Going through the chess store, you find yourself in the sewer system, and you run into Ada again. Leon manages to convince Ada to stay with him this time. After a short trek through the sewer's corridors and down an elevator, we see Annette Birkin. Without explanation, Ada chases after Annette, but Annette fires her gun at Ada. Leon jumps in front of Ada, shielding her from the rain of bullets, and gets shot in the process. Switching to Ada, we chase after Annette, catching up to her. 
Annette knows about Ada's background with Umbrella. Ada's boyfriend, a man named John, worked for the pharmaceutical enterprise years ago. After a short conversation, Annette notices the necklace Ada is wearing happens to be Sherry's necklace. The two start fighting over Annette's gun, but Ada just knocks Annette's lights out and she falls over the railing and down into the disgusting sewer water below. Too bad. Switching back to Leon, we head into the sewer and meet back up with Ada. Ada patches up Leon's wound, and together they leave the sewer and head to the Sky Tram. During their ride to the factory, they're attacked by the mutated William Birkin on top of the tram. Birkin is punching his arm through the ceiling, desperately trying to get at Leon and Ada. Once you arrive at the factory, Birkin backs off and leaves you alone for now. This time, the elevator platform is already down in the chemical plant because Claire and Sherry just came through here. You take a small elevator down one floor to a monitoring room, and you find the control panel key to bring the platform back up, but Mr. X also shows up to stop you. After dealing with your pursuer, you head up to the control panel and bring the platform back up. Leon and Ada board the train, when all of a sudden the car starts to shake and a giant clawed hand busts through the wall striking down Ada. Birkin is back, and this time he's more powerful than when Claire fought him here. Just like the first platform battle, Birkin is really tough, but after a long fight, he flees, leaving you to head back inside to check on Ada. Going back inside the train, you find that Ada is severely wounded, and our two characters have a nice touching moment together. I think I feel some love blossoming. The platform's motor overheats, stopping the train on a higher floor. Leon decides to go out alone to see if he can find some medical supplies for Ada, and if he can get the platform back up and moving again. Leon crawls through a ventilation shaft, and with the worst luck ever, the platform starts moving again as soon as he leaves Ada behind. This brings us to the lab's upper floors, where you find a locked power room and reactivate the main elevator. Riding the elevator down to the primary section of the lab returns you to the train platform where you find that Ada is gone. Exploring the lab, you'll be fighting monsters and solving puzzles that lead you to finding the power room key. You head back to the power room, but you're intercepted by Annette. Leon and Annette argue back and forth about Ada being a spy working for Umbrella. Leon doesn't believe her. All of this is interrupted by the persistent Mr. X. Escaping the behemoth, you make it to the power room, where Mr. X has you cornered once again. This time, Ada shows up, distracting the colossal creature. But Mr. X grabs Ada by the neck, strangling her. Ada unloads a full handgun magazine into his face, prompting the monster to throw Ada into some nearby electrical equipment. The creature falls over the railing of the walkway into a huge vat of flammable liquid. Leon rushes over to Ada, but it's too late. She's bleeding out. The two share a moment together before Ada passes away. After saying goodbye, we pick up Ada's master key and leave the power room as the self-destruct system activates. As we leave Ada behind, we see a massive claw-like hand emerge from the vat of flammable liquid. Uh-oh. We get a call from Claire who informs Leon that he needs to get Sherry from the security office before they leave. Heading down the main elevator, we pick up Sherry and use the master key to get to the transport platform. Reaching the platform, Leon puts Sherry into the train and goes to reactivate the train's power. Once you replace the train's power cables, the lights turn off. Mr. X is back. This time, he's completely mutated. This battle is really tough. X has this huge lunging attack that has an incredible range. He could be across the room and just fly right up to you in an instant. After a certain amount of time passes, a shadowy figure calls out to Leon and drops him a rocket launcher. Was that Ada? Picking up the rocket launcher, you finally put a stop to your pursuer in the best possible way. Game over. Later, loser. Time to get on the train and go. As the train is leaving the station, Claire shows up in the nick of time and hops aboard. With Sherry cured and both Leon and Claire together, the three ride the train out of Raccoon City. It's finally over. Warning. Biohazardous outbreak imminent. The emergency system has been activated. This train will detonate. Repeat, this train will detonate. What's wrong? I don't know. The door won't open.
It's Birkin. He's back, and this time he's just a hideous blob of razor-sharp teeth and tentacles. The door to safety is shut. There is no turning back from this fight. Birkin has you cornered as he slowly approaches. This guy just won't quit. Even after you defeat him, he still regenerates and pushes onward. You're trapped on a non-stop self-destructing train with a giant creature. Our three heroes work together to stop the train. Sherry crawls into the main control car and hits the emergency brake. As the train stops, Leon, Claire, and Sherry make a break for it. Now, it's finally over. We all made it out alive, and our story is capped off with the second best line in video game history. Come on, time to leave. Now? What's wrong? Is something following us? We have to go. We don't have any time to waste. Go? Where? Hey, it's up to us to take out Umbrella. Resident Evil 2's story is so good. As much as I love the first game's simple escape setup, RE2's story is like 10 times better. It takes that basic escaped concept and just pushes it further and further as the game goes on. In the first Resident Evil, there was one giant mutant guy right at the very end, but in this game we get two hulking behemoths that are seemingly unkillable, tracking down each character throughout the entire game, and they just keep getting scarier and stronger as you progress. And you have to escape a city. The stakes are so incredibly high in this game. Our characters actually feel like human beings, too. If RE1's voice acting was comparable to a third grader's stage play, RE2 feels like a badass 90s anime. All of the voice actors did a really great job at bringing these characters to life. Their performances aren't super realistic or even Hollywood, but they're all memorable. Paul Haddad and Allison Court as Leon and Claire are amazing. Each character has a clear and distinct goal and personality. Leon is really cute in this game. He's so innocent and just wants to do the right thing in this terrible situation he's been put in. He always has a hopeful outlook on things, and he tries his best to do everything in his power to protect the people around him like a real police officer would. But ultimately, he learns that sometimes you can't save everyone. And that's really great character building. It's also great when no one listens to him. Ada, wait! Hey! Leon, are you still there? We're leaving. Are you crazy? The streets are still crawling with zombies. It'll be alright, trust me. We found a way to the sewer. Follow us later. Claire! Claire! Wait, wait! Man, why doesn't anyone ever listen to me? I also really love the dynamic between Sherry and Claire. Towards the end of the game, you find out that Sherry has pretty much been alone for most of her life. Her parents were off working for Umbrella, so seeing Claire look after Sherry like an older sister and saving her from this nightmare is really awesome. Both of our main characters have very relatable character traits and motivations. They're both young and likable, and they stand out more than the characters in the first game ever could. It's pretty obvious why so many people like Leon and Claire the most out of all of the characters in the series. Another really awesome thing about RE2's story is that everything that I told you in my story recap can play out in a different order. I mentioned this earlier, but the reason why each character has their own disc is because both characters have an A and B scenario. So basically, when you start the game for the first time as either Claire or Leon, you start their A scenario. Once you finish the game, your save file turns into the other character's B scenario, and when you load up that save, you start a new game from the other side of the story. You get to see what the other character was doing during your initial playthrough. That's pretty cool. Huh? The way I usually play the game is Claire A, then Leon B, but you could choose to play Leon A or Claire B, or you could just play through both. I'd say it's worth playing through both of the full campaigns because you're going to be experiencing different events in each scenario. It's kinda crazy if you think about it, you're getting four separate stories out of this game. Talk about replay value. And of course, when I was recapping my playthrough, I may have left a few things out, so when you play the game, you'll be surprised. Other than the A and B scenarios, you can also unlock a bunch of super-powered infinite ammo weapons if you beat the game with a high enough ranking. You can also find a secret key that unlocks a closet full of different costumes if you make it to the police station without picking up any items in the beginning. Excuse me. Reach to the police station. This time you'll also unlock a new mode, the fourth survivor, where you play as Umbrella Agent Hunk. Hunk's game is tough as nails. You have a preset inventory and there are no item pickups, so you have to play very carefully if you want to make it through the night. 
Later releases of RE2 also included another game mode called Extreme Battle Game, where you choose a character and work your way up from the lab back to the police station. The amount of content you get with this game is really great. This game is definitely worth every penny. As you guys probably already know, this game sold extremely well, and is often considered the best game in the series by many people. RE2 was also ported to a bunch of other consoles as time went on. These ports even include unique features like skipping the door opening animations and the cutscenes. The GameCube and Dreamcast versions in particular look really good too. They actually went in and cleaned up a lot of the models and background for these ports. Resident Evil 2 is so popular that its environments and locales have shown up in a bunch of Resident Evil side games and spin-offs. This game, outside of the overall series, has its own legacy that's still being celebrated to this day. And it's no surprise, really. Resident Evil 2 is an incredible game that managed to improve upon everything that was introduced in the original Resident Evil, and that game was almost perfect. This is the part where I get a little personal. When I was a kid, I used to read video game magazines, and I would always see Leon in articles about RE2. I'd say to my older brother, I want to be the blue guy. When I eventually got the game, my brother bought it for me, along with a Leon action figure. I used to play this game with my brother and friends all the time, just trying to unlock everything. I have so many good memories of RE2, and whenever I play it, it really brings me back to a more innocent time. And that's why I'm so happy I got to play it again for this video series. I still remember the night when I beat the game for the first time with all of my buddies around me. Being in danger status and landing the final shot on William Birkin, winning the boss fight, was truly a magical experience. If you've never played this game, I hope this video got you more interested in trying it out. Kamiya and his team really outdid themselves with RE2, and I just want to say thank you to Kamiya-san and everyone that worked on this very special game. Not even starting from scratch could stop them from making the perfect sequel. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed the second part of my Resident Evil retrospective analysis series. I don't really know what category these videos fit into yet, I'm just having a lot of fun talking about these games. This video was kind of a pain to make, the writing process took forever because I couldn't decide if I wanted to cover the entire story or just give a short summary. But I think the story is way too good not to talk about the whole thing, you know? I want to take a moment to give shoutouts to some very special people. First off, huge shoutout to my consistent artist, Dross Art. He does all of the Avatar thumbnail stuff for my videos, and I just wanted to say thanks because I haven't done that yet in a video. Love ya, BB. Another shoutout to Detective Pardo, who drew Leon and Claire for the thumbnail. Pardo does a lot of Resident Evil art, and you should check out her Twitter. I'll leave a link down in the description. I'd like to also thank Itla for doing this amazing outro art that's on screen right now. Itla is a champ for doing this piece on such short notice. Thank you, Itla. I also want to give some shoutouts to some very awesome Resident Evil content creators. If you guys haven't seen his stuff yet, please check out Avalanche Reviews. He's been doing a full Resident Evil retrospective series, which includes the mainline and side games. It's very well produced content, and I highly recommend it. Also, if you're a big Resident Evil fan, please check out Carcinogen SDA. He speedruns like all of the Resident Evil games, and his commentary is always very insightful. Recently, he actually did a full playthrough of Resident Evil 3 with the game's director. It's a really interesting watch if you're a big Resident Evil 3 fan, like I am. So yeah, go check out Carcy, he's amazing. Everyone's links will be down in the description. Be sure to check them all out. Also, if you enjoy my content and want to support me, please consider supporting me on Patreon. It's only $1 a month, but I also have a bonus podcast-like show called Inside the Sphere at my $5 tier. It's a really fun show. I talk gaming news and what I've been up to recently. All of the support I've been getting from Patreon has done a lot to improve my content here on YouTube. Last month I was able to acquire a FrameMeister upscaling device, and this month I actually upgraded my editing software to Adobe Premiere. So I'll leave a link down in the description box. Any support that you can offer really helps me out. Also, one last shout out to all the people currently supporting me on Patreon. It means the world to me. You guys are legends and are actually keeping this channel up and running. So yes, thank you so much. Anyway guys, I'll talk to you later.